Okay, well, welcome everyone to this uh, new program we have started at uh, Knox. This is called the Let Your Light Shine series. And the idea for this came from, of course, last year's stewardship campaign and really showcasing the many people among us who are a light in the community, both in the immediate community and in the greater community. And um, so these are going to be just simple conversations. Uh, we're not necessarily going to hear or worship anyone. It's more uh, conversations <laughs> and, uh, and really, uh, you know, so it's as much questions and comments uh, from the audience as well. And uh, so the, <clears throat> and some of the thinking behind this is we as human beings are inspired and, um, you know, grow by following examples. And, uh, you know, it could be the example of a parent, it could be an example of a teacher, another member of the community, and of course our church and the community provides many people who are who can be inspiration and examples for us. And you know, and the calling for we'll focus on service, and the calling for service comes in different forms. So each person receives a calling in a different way, and um, and responds in a unique way that with their gifts. And uh, we'll talk about some of the things like you know what are the uh, you know, how did they respond, you know, what was the journey of service and, you know, how did they even, um, you know, what are the hurdles and challenges they encountered, how did they bring creativity to bear on on their uh, life of service. So we're very happy to have uh, Jim Wonker as the first person in this uh, series. So, and we have uh, Karen and uh, Jeff who can share some of their experiences uh, growing up as uh, Jim's children and how it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> how that uh, Don't let him talk too long. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we have Joyce Steiner who's over here who will kind of be a little bit of the moderator for this. But we really want this to be a conversation, you know, time for you, even you to reflect on, you know, what kind of callings you had and what might be some takeaways for you from the life journey of a gym and we'll have other people uh, following you know the next one will be right after we start the uh, uh, fall uh, two, uh, two service schedule so so this is the start so welcome Jim thank you for your services that you know we're just getting to know you we've known you for 36 years now Thanks so, for all the good boat rides. <laughs> so, okay, so Joyce. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So we have a few questions for you, Jim. Okay. And then we'll have a kind of a forum with everybody. Okay. But the first question is, can you share with us your Knox story? What drew you to Knox? How did you become a member of Knox? Gladly. Uh, those of you who know my wife when she was leading the Stephen Ministry program here, she had one of her favorite saying was, pay attention to the God nudges in your life. When God has something in store for you to do, when it's your turn, he's going to nudge you somehow, some way to get moving. And when my dad died suddenly when I was about 11, and my older brother was getting ready to graduate from high school and go off to World War II, my mother found a place for us to live in Hyde Park, and I went to Withrow Junior High. And there one day, a young man, a friend of mine, Withrow Junior High, walked up to me and said, would you go to Sunday school with me at Knox Church? And I said, sure, because we weren't able to get downtown to my father's church anymore. And uh, so I came here to Sunday school, junior high, fell in love with it. The rest is history. <laughs> A lot of history. But I just uh, then, of course, went through high school, Sunday school and youth group. And then when I went to UC, we had a college age group here at Knox, which was so important. And then uh, 
after I, through all this, so many Knox members, women and men, became role models and mentors for me. And as I grew older, I thought, you know, I'd like to do this someday, try to have an impact on people's lives. So after finishing the University of Cincinnati, and I spent the summers in college working at the Y camp as a counselor, which further strengthened the interest in working with people. And uh, after a couple of years in the Army, I came back and I started teaching a Sunday school class of high school young men. And Laura would know that one of my favorite pupils was her dad, <laughs> Jack Stith. And then when Laura and I met, she was teaching high school. So we had that common love for working with teenagers. And when we married, she and I taught a senior high class of young men and young women here and were youth advisors here for a while, all of which was strengthening my interest in having an impact on the lives of people and other people having, including the young people, having impact in our lives. So then other opportunities came along to serve on session and chair some committees. So it's been a, almost a lifetime story. And these two have grown up here and uh, have taken responsibility, been on session, chaired committees. So as I say, the rest is history after God knows that young man to get me to know. It's, a, it's great to hear that somebody's invitation brought you here, and that also you are the kind of person who invites and engages people, so I, I love that, I love that. Um, my next question is, how and why did you become involved in the jail ministry? And how did this ministry impact you personally? Well, that could be a day story. <laughs> <laughs> Again, God nudges. I was on session one evening when a group from Indian Hill Presbyterian Church came to session and told us about jail ministry and invited us to go with them and see if that's a challenge we would like to take on ourselves. Excuse me, Dad, what year would that have been? Oh, 20 years ago, whatever that year is. <laughs> And uh, so a few of us went, women and men, and spent several weeks going with their team and learning about jail ministry and the impact it can have on the lives of those in prison as well as on our own lives. And uh, after a few weeks, we decided we can do this. So we formed our own team of women and men and back before the pandemic, we went every week from 9 to 10 in the morning to the Hamilton County Jail or to where we go now, River City, or to Women and Men's Adapt, which are drug rehab programs. Since the pandemic, we now go the second Sunday of every month to River City, which is a minimum security correction facility over on Coleraine Avenue in Camp Washington. It's uh, for those people that are there, they've been through jail, maybe some through penitentiary. Uh, their progress has been good, and they're now in the last stage before being released to the community. It's a dormitory facility, it's not cells, and there are four pods, three for men, one for women. And we're assigned to one of those pods each time that we go. Church is voluntary for them. It's from 9 to 10 on Sunday morning. And so the numbers vary depending on the pod, depending on the particular Sunday. But we don't go for the numbers. We go to whatever impact we might have on their lives and the impact they can have on our lives because it goes both ways. We use a Bible study approach because we want to involve them in the morning and uh, help them find what they think the messages are and the scriptures that we use and how those messages can impact their lives for good when they get out. Mes scripture messages like the prodigal son, and the uh, good Samaritan, and the lost coin, 
ones that Adam used here recently, um, the fig tree that was given another chance, and cast your net on the right side of the boat, make right choices, those kind of scriptures. And it's very inspiring, it really is. And uh, we hope we plant some seeds. We have little opportunity to see them again. And just hope and pray that some seeds we planted will help them and they plant seeds in us. It goes both ways. So that's if I can much. prompt him, tell the story about the guy you saw at Crone Conservatory that one day, because that sort of epitomizes what this is all about. And well, for years we bought Bibles paperback Bibles that we could take down to the jail and everywhere else we went. And they were very welcome to the people we were meeting with. And uh, one Christmas, Lori and I were over at the, Chris, the flower show in the conservatory and this young man walked up to me and said, you may not remember me, but you came to prison and, and I met you there. And your church gave me a Bible and it changed my life. You don't look for that kind of response, uh, but you just hope and pray it happens. And that was very exciting and inspiring when it did. So. Thank you. So I was going to ask you another related question, but you talked about, you know, it's not about the numbers, right, when you do the service and listening to God's nudge. But can you go tell us a little bit more about, did you feel a spiritual calling that started you on your life of service? How did that, you know, how did that evolve over time? Well, it's evolved through a lot of people. I mean, I, I did feel a calling to work with young people, to be involved in their lives. And I did feel a calling, uh, one of the, I did feel a calling to uh, get involved in this jail ministry. I think it's where God wanted me to be. Um, the next question, can you tell us a little bit about obstacles that you might have encountered or a time where you felt like, gosh, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. So, you know, that where you may have felt discouraged and what was your Well, reflection? we talked about numbers a moment ago and, and uh, when, when you walk through a, a pod and see 30, 40, 50 men sitting there, women sitting there, and maybe three, four, five, six, or eight come to church. And that can be discouraging, but then we thought, wait a minute, the numbers don't count. What counts is those who do come and whether we can impact their lives. So, That's great. That's great. Uh, we all know where two or three are gathered. Yeah. He's there. Right. Oh, that's good. Um, so the next question, and you mentioned a little bit your wife and some other people, but when you reflect over your faith journey, were there something or some buddies that really stand out that impacted you or helped guide you? Yeah, have, ever, have you ever driven on the Reed Harbin Highway? Yes. Reed Harbin was a pillar in this church and in the community. And I was blessed to have him be a role model for me once I got here when I was growing up and he told me when I finished college and went in the army he says come see me when you get back I'm going to have a job for you <laughs> and uh, so when I came back the first person I went to see <laughs> and uh, so he hired me and he told me don't leave your faith at church your faith belongs in the workplace your faith belongs in the community and that advice has stayed with me all my life and passed on to others like these two. And uh, the affirmation of that over the years that faith is wherever we are, we needed to put it to work. So he, he, he made a big difference when he gave me that, that advice. That's great. Thank you. Um, just two more questions from me and then we'll open it up. Okay. <laughs> um, so our lives and our faith are constantly changing, right? So how has your faith changed or evolved over time? So from the time you were invited here, from your friend from Withrow, through, you know, your life as a, you know, definitely an active person in the community, a father, a 
teach, or how did, how did that evolve over time? Well, maturing, faith is a process of maturing. I believe we've got to allow our faith to mature and uh, respond accordingly. And, and I had a good teacher in my wife. Another thing she shared that meant so much to me along the way and still does, when in doubt, do the loving thing. And uh, that allowed for growth in my service to keep that in mind. One time my boss at the chamber came to me with a knit problem and uh, said, what would your advice be? And I said, well, John, uh, as I was told many times, my wife, when in doubt, do the loving thing. He came back to me a few weeks later and said, thank you, it worked. So that's just an example of how faith matured. Be willing to talk about your faith. Uh, you don't have to wear it on your sleeve, just as opportunity presents itself, share what you believe and, and if they respond, fine. If they don't, if God told them, take the dust off your feet and move on. <laughs> Um, so, any additional thoughts on faith or service, how you let your light shine? Um, well, I don't know how my light shined, but I know a lot of you have shined your light on me over the years. It's a process of, of uh, being confident that you have something to share, that you have something that can impact somebody else. Life in good ways. When I look at Laura Deck out here and look at Joe Mormon and some of those we had in youth group, they're leaders of the church. Today, uh, it happened. I mean, God's, God's ready to make it happen. We just have to uh, let our light shine, be willing to believe our light can shine. And, uh, it does impact others, and then their light comes back and shines on you. So it's a two-way street. Thank you so much. That's my end of my formal moderator questions. And now mm -hmm. we have the opportunity to include a lot of your friends in the audience and people that you've known for a long time and maybe some new faces. So any questions for, for Jim? One other thought to your last question, excuse me, Nancy. <laughs> One of my favorite scriptures is in Philippians where he tells us to think about all the good things that are possible. And then he says, practice them. Mm -hmm. And we use that all the time in our jail ministry because they they know what practice is all about. They know what it takes and what results in practice. So put your faith to practice as, as a good impact. Excuse me. No. I'm sorry, Nancy. <laughs> I actually have two questions. Are there any people who started out in the jail ministry with you so long ago that are still on your team or still active with you? No. Uh, the present team is Emily Seeger, who's here, I think, and uh, Deb Fritz and Bob Green and myself. There's been numerous women and men over the years. And uh, so anybody interested, <laughs> come talk to us. There's always an opportunity. It was a hard transition. Thanks to these two people, uh, they found that was the right place to me. I, after I fell and broke my leg, I was in rehab in Marjorie P. Lee for a while. And then I had to go back in the hospital because of some other issues. And Marjorie P. Lee was in renovation, so they found St. Margaret Hall and uh, it's close to where those two are, and of course close to here. And uh, but making the transition to living in one room and no longer go back to my house uh, was a hard transition, but a lot of support from them and people from this church. 
And God responded to my prayers. This is where he wants me to be. What can I do to impact lives while I'm here at St. Margaret Hall? And what can they do for me? One of the nuns told me shortly after I got there, we know you're not Catholic, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your kind of your business life as well? What role you played in the community, in, uh, in, yeah, in the Cincinnati community? I was community. very blessed uh, to be involved uh, first with the company where Reed Harbor was, Cincinnati Gas Electric, now Duke Energy. And then had an opportunity to go to the chamber and help coordinate a regional economic development program for southwestern Ohio, northern Kentucky, and southeastern Indiana. And so many people came in my life during that process. Uh, and we developed a real team approach that everybody had something to offer, that we needed to work together for the good of the region. And she's a product of that. One of the major accomplishments was we helped Fidelity move their operations here and many other companies, as well as work with local companies that we could support in different ways. So every, every day was an opportunity to be in God's service just by working as a team, working with people, respecting everybody's gifts and putting those gifts to work for the good of the whole. So does that help answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe Jeff, you could well, it's, it's his story, modest, but yeah. I'll prompt it. He's got, he's got so many stories, he probably can't remember them all. But <laughs> talk about when you uh, thought about going into the ministry, because that's really a Israel's question about business. When, uh, if you, you know, when Laura and I were working with the Laura Dex and the Joe Mormons and the Jim Crossfits and others of the world, we thought about going into youth ministry, as Dave and Ed is, and... Uh, Went to see our pastor at that time, who was John Lord, and uh, John said, well, you'd be good at it, no question about it, but you might find that you'll end up more in management and administrative and not being involved in what you really love, which is day-to-day -day with the young people. And that's, that struck home with us, and it reassured that we don't have to be a, a person uh, like a a pastor like Adam or others who are trained in the ministry, that, that we all have a ministry. And uh, for us, it was better, more effective, a chance for the light to shine as lay people rather than as pastors. But we need the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe can you share, Jeff, some of the other business? And Fidelity was a big, uh, business that Jim enabled coming to Cincinnati, but there were others too, maybe you can just share some examples on how people were brought together. Well, IMS is a big one. IMS Pet Food Products, uh, the printing, what was the pr big printing company? Their paper company. International paper. International paper. He, um, I, you were involved in getting Delta to be, Cincinnati to be a big hub for Delta. As yep. I recall, he's a lifetime it membership to the Sky Miles. Miles. <laughs> 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 Too bad it doesn't get passed on in the following generations. <laughs> well, we bought another brewery here. A big brewery up in Butler County. James River, right? Who, who said that? Cooper. Oh, Cooper, good memory. Very interested in the architectural side. Oh. <laughs> well, he wouldn't say this, but he has a, and some of you may know this, but he has an award named after him. Ready Cincinnati is the economic development arm in Cincinnati, and that's what he used to do. And, and they have a James A. Wonker Award that they give out every year for companies that are. Where is that? Uh, the economic development uh, company in Cincinnati, Ready Cincinnati. They have an award named after him. Oh, that's awesome. And it's for companies that are having the greatest impact on the region and the community and are making a difference and really good companies. And he, he wouldn't, he's too humble to share that with you. But it's a, it's a really big deal. And 
special. They have him down every year, and he presents the awards to the winners. So um, he made his impact, and it's related to faith because, like he talked about, it doesn't have to be with ministry, but everything he did. And you know, he doesn't always, like he said, wear it on his sleeve, or he will talk about it. He's talking about it today. But the thing that always strikes me about him is he he just lives it, and I think that has the greatest impact on people sometimes. That's the boy I raised. <laughs> <laughs> he tells me what to say. <laughs> okay. My grandfather always said, Kay, out of everything bad comes something good. Would you speak to that? I mean, you lost your father very young. And well, that's um, right. Uh, and when I look back at that, your point is a, a real good one. I thought of things that happened in my life after that, like being brought to Knox. Mm -hmm and all the opportunities that the door opened, all the people that have made a difference in my life. Uh, as much as I miss him, there was, God had a reason that good things would happen if, if we, you know, when I lost my wife and their mother, uh, that was a hard time, which exactly. all of you who have been through that knows what that's like. But again, uh, kept being reminded that uh, we can, we can come back from that. We can, mm -hmm. we can find good. As it says in the scripture, the light shines and the darkness cannot overcome it. Cooper? Yes, you know, um, back to the chamber work. I remember the Marine Business Accelerator um, starting up years ago. And then that um, Eric Kearney and the African American Chamber, um, and then their membership in Carmel. Protests, how you got involved with the African American, the black community. Well, and that's yeah, one of lifetime. my community involvements, which was a real blessing, was a Seven Hills Neighborhood House, which is a social yeah. service agency that serves West End and Avondale. Mm -hmm. And that was a great experience because it brought me into relationship with people I would not normally meet or have a relationship with. It opened up doors to help me appreciate. What other people do, and uh, back quickly your kitchen question about St. Margaret. I mean, that's been a lesson for me to learn how those people care for people like myself and what, what a difference they make. But anyhow, Seven Hills Neighborhood House, I was very involved on the board during some of the riots that happened here in Cincinnati, and that was a challenging time and <laughs> discouraging time, but also a growth time. And, an inspiring time to see how many people stepped up to the plate to try to get us through those periods. And Seven Hills, I think, or was a United Way member, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Karen was also on that board later on. So those opportunities, you listen to God's nudge and get involved, and all kinds of good things happen. I will speak to that just as a as one of his children that that was just something that was a part of our lives growing up thankfully um, it just was in the fabric of our lives so it, and we each had our own relationships and friendships with you know people of color kind of throughout but it wasn't anything that was any different to us which so I'm very grateful for that because yeah. It was well, a, a blessing not to, you know, be, have a certain viewpoint. Two Other than just uh, be directors friends. of Seven Hills were football-sized African-American men. <laughs> they came out to the house one night during one of the riot periods to talk about some things. That, and Jeff was always wearing a football helmet. A lot of tackle people. <laughs> <laughs> was up. But these two guys were big. But he sat on the one's lap and he said, are you the same color all over? <laughs> <laughs> and that was, those, those two guys just laughed at it. It gave me a whole new appreciation of, of what other people were truly like. Uh, I, I, I'm 
familiar with that story more than I remember it. But, um, <laughs> it's, it's stayed with me as long as I've been old enough to realize he, he had those people over for dinner um, at a time when, you know, we lived in a predominantly probably all white neighborhood. And it was a time, sadly, when, you know, that wasn't seen too well by the neighbors. And, and again, I'm relating the story as I've heard it, but that's a testament to his faith that that was just, that was the right thing to do. And it wasn't a popular thing on his street or in the neighborhood, but he, he's like, I'm doing it because it's the right thing. And it's, it, that story has had an impact on me in many ways throughout my life just because that wasn't easy to do. But that's, you know, that's his face and I'm going to do the right thing. Well, other people taught me it's always a team effort. Mm -hmm. Max? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, changing the orientation a little bit. I mean, Jeff and Karen, you're obviously very proud of that. And, uh, you know, Jim, thanks for the example you set for all of us. And, and, and when we look across, I mean, how lucky uh, certainly I feel. And every year that goes by, I feel more lucky to have a father that I've got a lot of respect for that's taught me lots of things and we can appreciate, you know, the people that don't have fathers like but one of the questions I have is more for Karen and Jeff, and it's, you know, when you look up and you see the example your father set, and the bar he set, I mean, how do you think about following that? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's fantastic. So thanks for all of you for, for sharing. Great question. <laughs> it's, I mean, to be honest, it's a, been a challenge, because not just dad, but mom too. They're, you know, high bars, but not, that they ever put pressure or it's just you know you see their lives and the upside is that you know um, as we've talked with Israel like it, it is a generational flow if you're open to it you know, they've taught us in whether specifically or just by observation and modeling that how to give to just give back it's just a, in the fabric of both of our lives but it's also a challenge sometimes because you know I Dad has a faith and in, in he, just so you know, he, ever since I can remember, every morning he reads the Bible and every morning he reads the upper room. I mean, there's not a day that goes by. I'm sure that you haven't done that. And that's, I mean, if I only did a fraction of that, <laughs> my life would probably be more fruitful. But, you know, yeah. It, it definitely can be a challenge, but it's also incredibly inspirational. And, and like with mom gone, it's, it's you know, devastating, but I was reading, I wasn't able to be at Craig Richmond's memorial service, but there's such a beautiful saying he had, like if you can model, the, someone said that model the life of the person that is gone. You can live their inspiration. And so in some little ways, if I could do that for mom, that helps. Yeah, it's really insightful, Max, because you know I, I've thought about that a lot, and lived it <clears throat> as Karen has, um, and you know, growing up when you're younger and not so wise yet, um, you sometimes don't want to be like your parents. I'm sure we've all felt <laughs> that, and, <laughs> and, and not that I ever thought anything bad about them at all. But you're trying to find your own identity and your own who you are and uh, your personality and. You know, I would say when I was younger, sometimes people say, oh, you remind me of your dad. And that's, again, not that I was offended by that, but it's like, I don't, I'm not my dad, you know? <laughs> and now, if I hear that, it's the greatest compliment to me, and I'll, I'll take it any time, any day, that somebody says anything that, that I got from him, either DNA-wise or just as sunk into who I am. Um, you know, I, I kind of embrace it now, Max. I, I, I you know, I, it, it, and I'm not, don't know that I'm comparing myself to him at all, but I'm just saying um, it, that's been a transition throughout my life of, you know, trying to be different, my own person, to like, I'll take whatever I got from these people, my mom and my dad. So. When my wife and I first had these two, and largely to her credit, we our decision was to raise them to be their own people. That each of us as an individual to not be us, but to be their own person. And to grow up to be a responsible, hopefully, Christian person witnessing to their faith. And 
obviously what did they do, thank goodness. And I give my wife a lot of credit for helping me be whatever good dad that I was. Uh, and again, it's important that that they stand on their own two feet, as I said, be their own person, and make their own light show. We're grateful that it does. Yeah, Jim. I mean, Bill, I'm sorry. Uh, how do you, how would you recommend, or how do you see, growing your ministry in, in the prison ministry? How do we take the message that we hear on Sunday morning and start to take it out into the community? Uh, I mean, you mentioned yourself and Dr. Reed and Emily and Deb Fritz, but how can we grow that ministry? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, during during the during the pandemic, or before the pandemic, we went somewhere every week, every Sunday. And it would be nice if we could get, grow it back to that time again when other places are being ministered to uh, by people like ourselves. Uh, the uh, there are plenty of facilities around that need somebody to come and, and do do that kind of ministry to those people. Because as we all know, now our lives have been changed, their lives are, can be changed because of the same thing. But I think for the, you know, in the meantime, we just got to keep doing what we're doing here at Knox, having a jail ministry team and, and supporting it however we can. Uh, we hope there's a time again when maybe we'll be be able to bring Bibles into these facilities. Uh, the reason they got shut out was that somebody in a hardback Bible brought in with a hole cut out in the back cover with drugs. So that wiped out that opportunity. Uh, but maybe that chance will come again. Maybe there's a way we can figure out how to get more resources into the jails and, and uh, halfway houses and, drug and rehab centers to help those people get ready. The other thing we can do, and, and you know, Jenny's husband has been involved in this, is help find jobs. Uh, it's very important as a transition from, from being in prison and, and in the correction facility to where they're now out in the community. There are plenty of companies here in town that will hire these people. And it's important that we are aware of where those places are so we can take that information into the ministry. There are plenty of churches that will house, welcome these people when they come out. We try to do that, but we're not the same neighborhood that most of these people grew up in. But a few did show up from time to time here. But we can support Third Church, which is a more likely neighborhood where some of them will be as we are in, in different ways. And you'll hear more about that when you talk to Barry mm -hmm. in a little while. But uh, so maybe that's a helpful answer to your question is to, and we, we help with housing. Jenny's been important in, in affordable housing. And, and uh, some of these people have a family to go back to, some don't. So making the transition into housing those kind of needs, I think, maybe helps answer that question. So we can be more involved. Make sure we can play a part in that. Laura? Yeah, Laura. I've been a member of this church since the day that I was born. <laughs> and uh, my children, very appropriately, would tell you that was 29 years ago. <laughs> but really, it was 55 years ago. And for as long as I can remember, there have been people in this church who shine very brightly. And so I feel like this theme has been so appropriate. And you and Mrs. Wolver were certainly two of those bright lights for me as a child, as a young adult, and is now a middle-aged adult in this church, as was Nancy Mormon. 
Um, and what is so important about your light is that it's not a spotlight that shines upon you. It's a light that comes from within and that reaches out and touches other people. And so I feel so grateful for the impact that you have had on my life. Thank you. That's, that's inspiring. <laughs> um, I had the same question that Max had, ironically. And, and so I'd like to change my question a little bit and just ask each of you to share one of your favorite memories of your dad or your dad and your mom um, in their role in this church that you witnessed. <laughs> well, put me on the spot, mm. especially <laughs> after you choke me up. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I'm going to directly have a memory, um, but I loved what you said, and it, it's related to something I was going to talk about, about him and this whole theme of let your light shine and that spotlight analogy. I was thinking about that too, and you appropriately said he does he never shines. This, this is, I don't want to say hell in church, but this is, this is <laughs> difficult for him to be in the spotlight. He doesn't like to be in the spotlight. So, um, but even in terms of what he does by letting his light shine, it's not a spotlight on other people too. It's, it's little things. And some of you have talked, and he's talked about being in the home he's in. Little things like every one of those nurses or nurses' aides or people that he touches every day, the custodians that come in the room and clean it up, he takes an interest in their lives, he talks to them, he listens to them, and it's completely genuine. And, and those aren't big things, you know, and those aren't banging your chest and talking about your faith, but it, again, is living your faith. And, and we see it, he wouldn't say it, he might not see it as much as we see it, but he's impacting those people every day and everybody he comes across. And you know, Max and Laura have known Karen and I for a while and, and you know, kind of related to Max's question growing up and your dad's the greatest guy and not that we might hear in that, but we've heard that our whole life. And you know, what, what really has made that kind of impact on people and why he has that sort of legacy is, is not, Big things, but little things that he does, and things we can all do. He just does. You know, I need to do more of them. But uh, he's—it's it, just that spotlight analogy was great. So I didn't give you a story, but that's kind of my take on this. You know, Nancy, you asked a question earlier about my transition to the St. Margaret Hall. One of the, one of the things I found out I, I can't get out and visit people can't drive a car or any of those same things. I found out a telephone could be a good ministry. Yeah. And so I just try to keep in touch with people. That way, whatever the willingness, reason for the call might be, I just feel it's part of what I can do. Now, God make it possible. I think, uh, well, um, so go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just gonna say, Laura, just uh, your, to your question, when I was little, and Jeff was little too, like I don't know, 11, 12, every, it seemed like every Sunday after church, we would have to go over to the College Hill Presbyterian Home Land Fair to okay. visit people. And um, it was always like, oh, we have to go. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> oh. but it was, I mean, it was just really, um, you know, it does end up growing on you a little bit, and you find ways to, like, that doesn't bother me at all to go in a nursing home to this day, because we had so much exposure to it, and, I mean, that's just an example of mom and dad, like, this is what we're doing, and they did it so well, and they didn't, they wanted everybody to feel still connected to Knox, even though they couldn't be there, and I think, you know, again, it kind of speaks to, you know, here you are, in a place now, and Knox members have come some very regularly and touched dad in different ways, and we're so appreciative because it's Knox reaching out again to people that can't be here that are limited in some way, and so, but that was just that, I mean, he didn't even speak to that, but there's, 
that was a ministry sort of on its own, visiting people that, that were uh, unable to come to us. Speaking of Reed Hartman again, when he passed away, we stayed in touch with his wife for many years. And she loved to go to the schoolhouse restaurant out in Camp Dunn. <laughs> How many of you have been out there? Order your food off the chalkboard menu on it. And, uh, and, and they also loved to go there because they could get peanuts out of the machine and feed the goats. <laughs> so that was part of our ministry to yeah. look after Reed Hartman's wife, who had been so helpful to us. Yeah, just building on what Karen was saying about the, the land fair and, you know, it was just always volunteerism and not just volunteerism, but, you know, he was a big brother to a young man who had a troubled life in many ways and a real interesting home situation, but, you know, we went over there and would have lunch with him and have dinner with him and saw some things I don't know that I want to see again, but um, it just sort of, like Karen said, got baked into us of, you know, this is what you do. You help people out. And, you know, again, that's an example of shining his light and mom too, of just, this is, this is, this is what you do question. and how you live. It wasn't something we love doing. We will be the first to admit, but, you know, over time, again, it sort of just melts into you and becomes part of who you are, hopefully. And, and that's an example of him and mom shining their light on, on us and how we live our lives now, hopefully. So. And that, that young man who is now an older man, a senior man, still, he's like, you know, in our family. He's part of our family and we text regularly and he and dad keep in touch. And it's, it's a lifetime. It was a lifetime mentorship. He was a young man who grew up in the children's home and they had different cottages there and we we adopted one of the cottages, Bill thinking of your mentoring program and uh, so something uh, God nudged me to have an interest in this particular young man so you never know how it's going to happen but it happens. Okay, uh, probably this has been a really great conversation. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Israel. Thank you. Inspiration for all of us. There's so much to, I guess, to discuss. But I think we probably anyone needn't go to church. Can uh, proceed to church. And, and just one thing. Thank yeah. you all because yeah. you're all an inspiration to us, and yeah. certainly to Dad. And it's just we're just grateful for that. It all started here with people like you when I was growing up. So. I'm very grateful. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.